Well, to explore how this ongoing conflict can be resolved, I'm joined now by former U.S. Ambassador to Azerbaijan, Matthew Breiser, and the head of the Other Azerbaijan Institute for Democracy and Human Rights, Ahmed Shahidov, and finally, Richard Geragosian. He's the director of the Regional Study Center, an independent think tank based in Armenia. Gentlemen, good to have you on the program. Ahmed, I want to begin with you. People talk about justice for Khojale. What does that mean? What would it mean now, 26 years on? Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, we need to pay attention to the uh, basic uh, course of this conflict. The Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict is the oldest ongoing conflict in the post-Soviet area, and the uh, base course of the conflict lies uh, in the uh, centuries-long Armenian territorial claims against Azerbaijan. And in uh, early 1988, the Armenians started uh, aggressive actions against Azerbaijan to implement the uh, long-standing plan to uh, secede uh, Nagorno-Karabakh from mm -hmm. Azerbaijan and annex it to uh, Armenia. So uh, the, uh, in uh, late 1991 and early, 19, uh, early 1992, uh, armed hostilities and Armenian attacks on Azerbaijan uh, uh, intens intensified and Kojale, the uh, town in Nagorno-Karabakh, became the target of these operations. And uh, from 25 to 26 of February in 1992, uh, by the support of former USSR uh, 366 regiment. Do you think, you, uh, I mean, and, and you're giving me a timeline here, and I'm yes, sorry for being yes, rude. Sure. Do you think it was ethnic cleansing and even genocide, as some have claimed? You know, uh, the uh, events in Kojale uh, is accepted by the international community as massacre, as genocide, because on uh, that night, uh, the Armenian armed forces killed uh, 613 uh, civilian people, and including 106 women, children, elderly, and or, or till uh, today, uh, 1,275 right. uh, people uh, uh, were missing. Certainly, and if I can go back to my fundamental question, yeah. what would justice mean for you today, in, in the year 2018? You know, uh, justice for Khojale means that all international community uh, must uh, recognize these events as massacre, as genocide, because there are a lot of uh, evidence, like photos, videos, uh, showing all these right. uh, massacres, killing, and the Azerbaijani journalist Chingiz Mustafa recorded all these events. So uh, you want you want recognition? Yes, that's what yes. you want. Uh, Richard, is it fair to say that Armenia has struggled to come to terms with the fact that they did unspeakable things on February 25th and 26th, 1992? I would say no, only because in the wider context, as distressing, as disturbing as the incidents were. It was part of a bigger chain of events from anti armenian pogroms in Sumgait and Baku onward. What worries me much more is trying to escape being a prisoner of the past and actually trying to deal with a very difficult present and looking to the future. In why, other can't, words, why can't both be done? To say, okay, this was a terrible massacre, civilians were massacred, the war was terrible, oh, let's move forward. And, oh, clearly, yeah. yes. The events, whether... whether it's a crime of genocide is a very difficult term to apply, especially in this context. Regardless, the loss of life, the tragedy, is a demonstration that all sides have suffered grossly. And yes, there does require a painful but sincere look at the past. My focus here, though, mm -hmm. is we have people dying on a weekly basis now in this conflict. Right. And in many ways, if we become too obsessed with one isolated incident rather than the wider context, this doesn't contribute to an environment conducive to a negotiated solution with concession and compromise from all sides. Okay, and I'm going to get Ahmed's response to that in just a moment. But first, Matthew Breiser, as a former U.S. ambassador to Azerbaijan, somebody who, could, who saw this unfold over the years in terms of peace negotiations and a frozen conflict, tell me why it's been so difficult to get anywhere near some sort of solution. Well, I actually was uh, one of the international mediators of the conflict for three years. We have a group called the Minsk Group under the OSCE with a Russian, French, and U.S. ambassador. Uh, and I can say we got pretty close in the uh, springtime of 2009 uh, and then in the autumn as well. The basic outlines of an agreement exist, and the basic principles have been agreed in principle by, by both sides. The problem is that what the political leadership finds 
uh, acceptable is not acceptable in the broader societies because so many emotions are still so raw, whether it's about hojali or whether it's about uh, protecting of civilians on both sides, whether it's about the fundamental legal status of Karabakh. And it all plays also back into the history of Turkey and Armenia and 1915 and all those events as well. Right. So people have long memories, deep wounds. Ahmed, would you accept Richard's argument that whatever happened, the people can't be held hostage by the past and need to move forward. You know, uh, as Mr. Gigasian mentioned about the, I'd say, uh, to look uh, to the future for both countries. Uh, I'm not politician, uh, I'm not historian, but I am human rights defender and I care about the rights of uh, civilian people uh, living in front line, uh, about the uh, women, children. But after uh, 25 years, after the Kojala massacre, uh, today we cannot uh, look to the future and to uh, how to say because the Armenian side continues the violation of international law, violations, violation of human rights in front mm -hmm. line. For example, uh, I uh, took uh, the photo of this two-year-old Zahra. Uh, she was killed uh, last year. If you want to show, I mean, you can you can in, hold it up in a bit. July. Yeah, so we'll in July, here. in Al Khanli village of Fizuli okay. district, mm -hmm. uh, during the arm shelling. Uh, or by the Armenian armed forces, uh, she was killed. And it's, it uh, happened after 25 years after Hojala massacre, and right. it shows that the Armenian side uh, is not ready for uh, uh, living together to get the peace, prosperity okay, so in this region. Okay, so Richard, the point is that what he's saying is that the status quo at the moment, low intensity conflict suits Armenia, and it's easier for Armenia than it is for Azerbaijan. Well, I would respectfully disagree. I don't think anyone is benefiting from the current escalation in tension. There are losses on both sides, but equally painfully, whether it's the death of a, of a tragic infant or toddler, we have similar examples on all sides. My point here is, in many ways, there is no winner for this. And in many ways, we need to find ways to de-escalate and return and re-engage to diplomacy Must over the occupation force of arms. end first before any of that happens? Because we heard that from Realistically, the foreign, foreign no. minister, In, uh, ministry spokesman as well. Realistically, We hear it about no. Israel, Palestine, we hear it about everything. Well, Crimea as well. It's like, okay, pull out first, then we talk. But realistically, no. And Tell I say what. that because if we look at the course of mediation hmm. and the diplomatic negotiations, one of the few bargaining chips for the Armenian side is the territories beyond the borders of Nagorno-Karabakh and their return to Azerbaijan. This, in other words, any kind of demand as a prerequisite to real diplomacy is both dangerous and rather non-realistic. Ahmed, non-realistic to ask for them to pull out before you can move forward. No, uh, let's go to the reason of this conflict. And uh, there are a lot of international norms, international law, and Geneva Convention. And uh, according to all these norms, the territorial integrity, which is the uh, basis of international law, uh, territorial integrity of Azerbaijan has been violated. And Nagorno-Karabakh, the other uh, adjacent seven regions of Azerbaijan are still under occupation of Armenia. Uh, in spite of that, there are four resolutions of UN Security Council about immediately releasing these occupied uh, territories and uh, returning uh, Azerbaijan refuge to these lands. Mm -hmm. Uh, the another international uh, resolutions of OEC, Council of Europe, the Armenian authorities uh, don't care about this resolution. Uh, but Azerbaijan is a multicultural country. Right. We, we haven't any uh, problem with uh, Armenian nation. Right. And today, in 2018, there are uh, 35,000 Armenians living in Azerbaijan. Even in the center of the Baku capital city, Gap Baku, we have Armenian church. And, okay. But uh, can, unfortunately, can yeah. um, um, unfortunately, Armenia destroyed all mosques in Nagorno-Karabakh, and uh, it's not uh, against only uh, Azerbaijan. It's against the, I would say, humanity. And but in spite of that, after 30 years of Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, we are ready to get the peace and prosperity. But there are uh, concrete reasons for getting this peace. I want to ask you about something. You mentioned yes. the UN Security Council yes. and resolutions. Yes. How do you feel about the fact that Russia is on the UN Security Council? 
And so you know, uh, uh, they're going to support you, Armenia no matter There what. are five members of UN Security Council and all of them accepted them, uh, these four resolutions. Uh, it, it happened in 1992 and 1993. Uh, all these resolutions talk about the territorial integrity of uh, Azerbaijan. Even the Armenia didn't recognize mm -hmm. Nagorno-Karabakh as an independent country. It means that Armenia recognized territorial in integrity of Azerbaijan. Right. But why uh, we uh, cannot get this peace? The, so it means that Armenia should uh, make first step to release these occupied territories, then the Azerbaijani refugees will return to this Nagorno-Karabakh as a occupied uh, lands. Then we, we are ready to give a uh, highest uh, status for Nagorno-Karabakh. You want them to make the first yeah, move, sure. right? And, and Richard's saying that's unrealistic for now. Matthew Breiser, we saw big trouble in 2016. It flared up. Yeah. We saw um, the Armenian president and an Azerbaijani diplomat trade barbs yeah. at at the Munich Security Conference uh, recently. How close are we to something really terrible happening very soon? I think we're less close than a lot of people fear. <clears throat> um, I think nothing big and terrible is going to happen without some premeditation. Uh, and that's because the sides, they, they, they know uh, what is required if there's going to be a mil major military maneuver. And I think you'd have to see the mobilization of significant, at least Azerbaijani forces. But that doesn't mean terrible things don't happen. I mean, as Richard was saying, well, we don't want to see, we want to see an end to these people being killed along the front lines, whether they're soldiers or, or, or as you were saying, whether they're civilians. Um, I think the basic, the bargain here in play and why, why there hasn't been the uh, fulfillment of the Security Council resolutions is indeed that uh, the structure of the agreement that's been negotiated for years and sort of agreed in principle by both sides is that the seven territories surrounding uh, Nagorno-Karabakh will be returned to Azerbaijan, mm -hmm. the occupied territories will be returned to Azerbaijan in exchange for some expression of self-determination of the Armenian majority population right. in Nagorno-Karabakh. That's a difficult balance to strike, but I think, I think the parties have struck it. Now it's time for political courage to push this through the society. Talking about political courage and the broader geopolitics of it all and political will, does it help that Turkey and Russia are somewhat decent with each other <laughs> right now because one side backs Azerbaijan and, and the other Armenia generally in this conflict. Yeah. Well, it, you know, I, I, I think it, it generally doesn't hurt. In fact, it's a good thing for the region if Turkey and Russia are not at each other's throats like they were after the downing mm -hmm. of that Russian aircraft that violated Turkish airspace. Um, when it comes to Karabakh, I, I think that ultimately there has to be an active role by the United States president because no matter what is agreed, if Russia supports it, even right. in Armenia there's going to be suspicion and even more so in Azerbaijan. So there needs to be some sort of imprimatur of someone seen of a side that's seen as being somewhat more neutral. One last point about neutrality that's ironic uh, or disadvantageous for some in Azerbaijan is that the three mediators of the, of the Minsk group, uh, Russia, France and the United States actually are the countries with the three largest Armenian diasporas. So right. That's hard to swallow in Azerbaijan sometimes. Right. That's fascinating. Right. We're almost running out of time. So Richard Geragosian, give me some room for optimism. I am optimistic. Chosen to live in Armenia, moving there from the United States. I'm optimistic because we're approaching a tipping point where force of arms, the military solution is increasingly revealed to be an empty avenue. In many ways, we need to recommit to diplomacy now in terms of confidence building measures. The second grounds for optimism is we may reach a solu solution based on statesmanship and based on demographic change, where the new generations coming to power in the region understand the fatigue and the conflict has mm -hmm. exerted too high of a cost. And in many ways, April 2016, the most serious fighting was important in terms of changing the landscape. Mm -hmm. Azerbaijan took back territory for the first military victory in many years. This should be a degree of more self-confidence by Azerbaijan and a return to diplomacy. This is what we're investing in. Ahmed Shahidov, yes. when you hear Richard say that, do you feel, well, if more Armenians thought like Richard did, maybe we'd get close to... Some no, sort of peace uh, I agree or with not? only uh, one uh, idea of uh, Richard about that uh, there is no winner 
in Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Only uh, uh, external powers, foreign powers who controls, for example, Armenia, uh, it benefits, uh, they benefit from this conflict if the Armenian people, the ordinary Armenian, should understand the uh, real situation in Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and uh, push uh, their uh, authorities to uh, sit uh, uh, face to face with uh, Azerbaijani uh, government and get gain the uh, peace resolution mm -hmm. and how to say to respect the international law, international conventions. I think that uh, Azerbaijanis and uh, uh, Armenians should live together, both in Armenia, in Azerbaijan, in Nagorno-Karabakh region and in other regions. But by respecting uh, the international law, the territorial integrity of both countries, the human rights, and uh, everything will be okay. Well, it's been ongoing for almost three decades. It's been important to have this discussion because even people who claim to be in the know about the world, whether Syria, Afghanistan, the Balkans, whatever, generally have no clue <laughs> about this. And I think that's why it's extremely important, uh, myself yeah. included, you know, and I think it's really important to have this yeah. discussion. Gentlemen, I thank you very much for joining us here on Center. the news. Thank you.